In this video, I'm going to give you real life examples of how different healthcare systems have affected me. So let's get started. Hey guys, thank you for joining me today. I'm Tiffany from Perfect Curl and I want to talk about a topic that has been one of the main focal points of policy for the past two presidents and has a polarized and usually heated debate. What I would like to do is give a little of my experience on healthcare having lived in the United States, Singapore, and now Canada. In 2005, I was visiting a cousin who had a dog. A situation happened where the dog got scared and happened to bite the closest thing to its mouth, which was my hand. The bite literally lasted one second, but long enough for one of its canines to sink down into my hand. I saw the hole and immediately said, I think I need to go to the hospital. To make a long story short, my wound became infected after a day and the redness was creeping up my arm. I ended up needing to stay in the hospital for three days so that I could have IV antibiotics. That was the only treatment I received. I had just quit my job, but luckily my insurance continued through the end of the month. So out of the $20,000 that I was charged for the three day stay, I only needed to pay a few thousand and that was partially due to being out of network. However, the fact that a stay in a bed, meals and IV antibiotics cost $20,000 is frightening. Fast forward five years, I'm now living in Singapore, a city state with one of the highest costs of living in the world which offers universal health care. Over the first summer there, I had a pretty nasty flare from my ulcerative colitis and ended up again in the hospital on three occasions for a total of 16 days. The total cost of my treatment was about 10,000 Singapore dollars or just under 7,500 US dollars, which I had to pay out of pocket only because it was pre-existing, meaning I got sick within the first year of coverage and it wasn't covered by insurance. I had numerous tests, IV medications, albumin transfusions, blood transfusions, the works. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, the care isn't as good as in the States. Okay, maybe Singapore might not have as advanced facilities as they're in the States, like Mayo and Cleveland clinics but there was a team of doctors who treated me and I do know that at least two trained in the US. The nurses were amazing and many of which actually came from the Philippines. I didn't feel a standard of care I received would have been any better had I gotten sick in the States. I only would have had to pay a considerable amount more of money. Actually, it doesn't really matter what I say. The system is considered one of the most efficient in the world and accounts for 1.6% of their GDP. It took me some time to get well, but eventually I was able to control my condition with diet and was med free for about three years after being on a stereoyodo, which is common with ulcerative colitis. I thus moved to Canada five years after that flare, which has a single payer system and their expenditures account for 11% of their GDP. I decided that it would be in my best interest to go back on medication since I wanted to get pregnant. Going on meds helps to ensure that inflammation is controlled and that my diet could be expanded. I went to a walk-in clinic to see a general practitioner so that they could refer me to a specialist, which in my case would be a gastroenterologist. She did and my appointment with him was set for three months away. She offered to give me a prescription of steroids, which I declined as I had been on them numerous times before and they have a bad side effect. Now, some of you may be saying, see those wait times? Well, yeah, a few months is a long time to wait. However, it wasn't an emergency. And since that initial consultation with the GI doctor, I've had regular check-ins and have not had any issue getting in to see the doctor if I needed to quickly. I was even able to get a colonoscopy done a week after my miscarriage last year. So far, for all of my doctor's visits and the colonoscopy, I've paid zero dollars. I ordered two of my three prescriptions through a dispensary. To date for this year, I've had $1,394 Canadian dollars in prescription charges. 
and have paid of that 144 Canadian out of pocket, which translates to about 115 US dollars. Speaking of miscarriage, I had two emergency room visits with a second requiring an overnight stay to monitor me post-surgery. I'm sure the fact that everyone is on the same insurance makes paperwork so much easier because all they need for intake is proof that you're covered, which you can put on your driver's license. I paid zero dollars for the emergency room stay as well. For my upcoming delivery, I will also have to pay zero dollars. For all of my ultrasounds and OBG Ryan visits, I pay zero dollars. I can't even tell you the charges, what they are, because I haven't seen a bill. I never feel as though I can't go to the doctor because I can't afford it. That situation actually happened to me while I was in the States between contracts and the reason why I used diet to control my colitis. At that time, I had no insurance and this was before the ACA or Affordable Care Act took effect. I was scared to rack up debt for doctor's visits and pharmacy medications and those weren't working as well as they should have anyway. So this is one of the reasons why it is so important for underinsured and uninsured people to get coverage. This population is usually poor and won't seek care until it is an emergency because of financial constraints, which drives up medical costs. This isn't a political thing. When you look at health outcomes and see that the US has the highest health expenditures in the world, accounting for 17.6% of their GDP and some of the worst health outcomes over many other developed countries, it just doesn't make sense. It boils down to access because we all know that the US has some of the most advanced medical centers available. No, there is no perfect system, and I'm sure that with any system anywhere in the world, we can cherry pick the flaws because certainly there are things within the Canadian system that could be better. However, that doesn't mean that the states can't learn from Canada and other countries who are doing some things right and pull from those. Instead of focusing on things that are going wrong, which is so popular in the media, why can't we focus on the good? If we want better health outcomes and less burden on the system, a few of the goals should be everyone participating in preventative care, staying on top of chronic illnesses to keep them in check, and educating the public on better health habits. These involved working together to make sure that all people have access to basic care. I'm not here to tell you one way is better than the other way. I just hope that giving you my firsthand experience, it can shed some light on the glaring differences between the systems. I hope that this information has been helpful and please comment below and let me know how you think the healthcare system in the States can improve. Peace.